I'm Bruce A. Parr, and this is Frank J. Rich, and you're watching Frank Talks with Bruce the Blog. Frank Talks with Bruce the Blog is brought to you by Chase Media Group, provider of multimedia marketing solutions for an omni-channel marketplace, as well as publisher of The Penny Saver. And we thank Carla Chase, our CEO, as well as my co-host, Frank J. Rich, for putting us up on your TV. And you can also see every episode of Frank Talks with Bruce the Blog on YouTube by searching for Townlink TV. Uh, if you're new to the show, and we always hope there are new people watching, uh, what we try to do with every episode and, and the guests we have is talk about uh, good things that are happening in your community, in the world at large, uh, and bring you people who are really interesting, uh, you may know about or maybe you don't know about, uh, who are trying to help the world and improve the world. And uh, this episode, we, we certainly um, have hit the jackpot, you might say, in, in a manner of speaking, uh, with our guests that we're really pleased to have with us. And, and let me introduce from left to right, uh, all representing Compass Westchester, which we'll explain in a minute what that is, is uh, Tom McCrossan. Thank you. And Mark McGoldrick and Devin McCrossan. And um, let's start, gentlemen, by talking about Compass Westchester, which is a new right, entity. Um, and uh, basically, in the town of Yorktown in northern Westchester, uh, you are seeking to establish what's called a sober living home uh, for people who are recovering addicts. Uh, and so maybe you could just quickly explain how a sober living home works and the kind of people uh, who would be living there. Sure. Um, you know, sober, sober living fits um, into what I would call the spectrum of recovery in that it, 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 it comes after someone gets out of primary rehab, which, which might be a 30 or 60 or 90 day stint in a rehab facility. And it's a bridge between when that person leaves rehab and re-enters uh, into their normal environment. So in, in, in many situations what you have is people who will travel long distances away to go to rehab and then when they return to their communities they have no um, sobriety and support network built around them. And by living in a residence like this they have time to establish that network uh, gain a longer period of time abstinent and away from alcohol and drugs uh, and gradually acclimate themselves back into their lives. And, and, and research would show that um, if someone can stay in a safe environment for 90 days or more, uh, that their chance of achieving long-term sobriety are dramatically greater than if they were to just go to a 30-day rehab and return to their home environment. Now, uh, some people uh, in the immediate uh, town of Yorktown, people who live there, uh, have used the word halfway house. Is that correct? Or? I can answer that if I oh, may. Okay. A halfway house, traditionally <clears throat> and most customarily, is a, a home where individuals who perhaps have been incarcerated in the past um, are, and are court main mandated uh, to a, 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 a living residence uh, for a period of time. Typically, uh, it is not a self-pay environment, but rather funded by some sort of state uh, funding. Uh, many of the halfway houses are also self-managed. And what I mean by self-managed is they are actually run by the individuals residing near themselves. Right. It, it is very different from a contrasting perspective to what we're hoping 
to propose and, and achieve, and that is our residents would have individuals who, one, are paying uh, because they want to get well. Secondly, they are not court mandated. Uh, they would be voluntary, and, uh, and they, uh, they essentially um, have had no uh, uh, interaction at all with the law, but rather um, uh, are individuals who, like mothers and fathers, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, people working, uh, whether they're doctors, lawyers, businessmen, or just everyday individuals who are trying to make a better life for themselves, would be the type of uh, individual we'd like to have reside at the home. Right. So, if I um, may, um, <clears throat> it sounds like uh, there is a, an issue with respect to how effectively someone moves from a, uh, a condition uh, such as a, a, a condition of addiction to uh, uh, drugs or alcohol to uh, back into society, and uh, and that that is um, variously managed. Uh, almost ad hoc by most uh, most people who are making that transition, since it represents, uh, I thought I heard you say earlier, some 10% of the population? Correct. Is that a fair statement? Correct. Okay. Ten, approximately 10% so, of, of our population today throughout the U.S. is suffering either with addiction or in, in the process of recovering from addiction. So then when, when we're presented in a community with an opportunity to help people, it is not so much those in the house, so to speak, uh, that you are providing uh, uh, assistance and transition for, but you're talking about potentially 4,000 people in the town of Yorktown who may be suffering from a similar condition. That's correct. Yeah. We, we believe that's, that that's that pretty number, startling. Yeah. 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 And their families like, who are affected by it. So it's yeah. more than, it may be 4,000 primary people who can be defined as addicts, but when you add their families, it could be, I don't know, 15,000, you know, whatever the number might be. Yeah. Typically, there's a minimum of at least three people affected by an individual suffering from alcohol or substance abuse. So it would seem that it would be in the best interest of, of, uh, of people in the community to want to reach out and help those that have these, this difficulty uh, integrate back into uh, a so-called uh, normal life, uh, so to speak. And anything that we could do uh, to aid that, it would seem to me natural right. uh, for a community. Um, and, yeah. and is that the response that you're finding in the? You know, one, one of the issues. This? One of the issues we're facing, and it's one of the, the problems with addiction and why it is such an untreated illness, is that there is a tremendous stigmatism around addiction, and um, people who don't understand it have you know, very negative views of what an addict is. They think of the homeless person on the street. They, they read articles about people breaking into homes to steal for their usage. And this negative stigmatism that exists and permeates the United States forces most addicts not to get treatment. It's, it's a significantly untreated illness. And so, um, you know, one of the things we're doing is bringing more to awareness that Addict, addiction is a disease, right? It's, it's recognized by the American Medical Association. It's a chronic, fatal disease, not unlike cancer or diabetes. Or but smoking. Or smoking. Yeah, right, yeah, right. <laughs> and it, but it can be treated. Right. It can be treated, treated with abstinence. And it takes someone, you know, many of these addictions form over years and decades, and it takes someone a period of time, and it's not 30 days, uh, to learn how to live a sober life and, and get back into uh, society and become, you know, contributing members like they were before yeah. uh, the addiction took over. Yeah. Is yep. it so different from, uh, from the, the challenges that we all face in preparing ourselves for healthy living or to be good neighbors? Right, right. Or, or, to be, or to better yourself. Yeah, yeah. or, uh -huh. or self-development. Self yeah. Is it so different from that? but for the mm -hmm. fact that one is a disease and, and but requires of us that we, that we identify the issue that we have, uh, we apply ourselves to the best of our ability and get the resources, friends, neighbors, family, and so forth to help us, and then we ultimately um, uh, find a way into the next level. Right. Is, is it really that different? It, yeah. it, it should not be. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, what I was going to say is it's inexplicable to me how anybody could say, I don't support sober living. But, but, you know, I would envy anybody who has the luxury 
of, of not understanding why this is important you know, for people to have a place like this. I don't care what community it is. In this case, it happens to be Yorktown. But um, I know in my family history, I have that. You know, and so um, maybe if you live a, a charmed life uh, and, and you've never ha had it touch you in your family, then you don't understand it or you choose not to understand it. But one of my questions is, ha is how did uh, each of you respectively uh, come to be involved in this? I mean, does it have anything to do with any of your backgrounds, mm -hmm. if you wanted to, to sure. discuss that? You let Devin, if yeah. you'd like to speak. Sure, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I myself uh, was... Uh, personally affected by addiction. Um, it started for me at an early age, um, throughout high school, um, lost a, a lot of opportunities along the way um, in terms of, you know, college sports. Um, and uh, it, it affected me. Um, it's affected other people in my family. Um, you know, along the way, I was able to get the help that I needed. Uh, sober living was an important one for me. Um, I was able to recover uh, since then. You know, I started a company uh, helping to provide, you know, services for individuals to get treatment as well. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I, that I saw along the way was uh, where it goes wrong is when people return home from treatment. Um, there aren't enough facilities, um, sober livings in particular, for individuals to go to after treatment. Um, for them to, you know, get used to the new lifestyle. It's a whole new life um, that they're experiencing. Um, it is a completely new way of living. So the individuals need the, the structured environment um, to be able to get back on their feet. And they're not bad people. Um, you know, one of the things that I had done early on was uh, I, I ran a sober living home. Um, and from that experience, um, you know, I, I was able to see how not to run right. a sober living. Um, some individuals weren't in it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. So, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this was to do it the right way, um, so that people, you know, can recover. Um, I approached, you know, Tom and Mark, um, and also Dr. Washington and Dr. Brotman, who are involved with us as well. Um, and I said, you know, hey, this is something that, that we should look at. Um, individuals need it, um, and I think we could really provide uh, extraordinary care and for, for us to be able to help a lot of individuals to, to recover um, and to get you know, back into the community, be an active member of society um, in, in a positive light. Um, and this is borne uh, out by the research that's done uh, uh, characterizing the transitions that people uh, make from addiction to full integration back into the community, that that uh, transition time is uh, better uh, prepared when, when there is a uh, a, a structured environment such as this one in between? Yeah, statistics have shown that 30 days is not enough time. 30 days um, is what insurance companies, if they reimburse, will reimburse for. So there's rehabs that are forced to take the 30 days be, because that's what's dictated by the insurance companies. And after 30 days, you're, you're, you're let go and out on your own. And, you know, a lot of the research would show that 30 days is an inadequate period of time, and the you know the relapse rate is fairly significant for people just going out of 30 days. If people can be in a safe environment for up to 90 days, uh, the success rate more than triples from a 30-day stint. Mm -hmm. And so, as you know, this becomes known, these sober living residences are becoming a much bigger piece and part of the part of the whole continuum of what we call continuum of, of care. Uh, around the treatment of addiction. Uh, take us through a typical experience, uh, someone who is actually yeah, in, in residence, right. what, and do they do? what do they do yeah. every day, right. and well, what's your involvement personally? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so, and, and Dr. Washington, um, d you know, described this at the Monday hearing about the typical person, but he could be a business executive uh, who has who's had a tr couple attempts at getting sober. It hasn't worked. He went back to rehab, he did his 30 days, he's now sober, he's ready to kind of return to his normal life, but his wife may not be ready to have him at home yet. She's saying, honey, we've been down this road before, I'd like to see you get, you know, 90 days, 120 days. Um, and so that person would then enter our sober living program. So 
he could be doing one of two things, right? He could be going to work during the day. So he gets up, comes to the house. The house has no medical or therapeutic services in it, right? So he'll come there, he'll sleep there, he'll wake up, we will transport him to work or to his therapy. Uh, he will then return to the house in the evening where dinner will be had by all the residences. And then, you know, nightly meetings, we, we encourage people to, to attend 12-step uh, meetings. Uh, the house is supervised 24-7, so there's always someone there. Um, and we have a curfew at, at 11 o'clock at night. And, you know, one of the, the other thing that statistics have shown on sober living is one of the real benefits of it is this communal environment that is created by having people who are like-minded mm -hmm. talking about the issues they face and the challenges and, oh, you know, I'm here because my wife is mad at me or I'm having this issue at work mm -hmm. or with a significant other. And so while it's not, there's no therapy or medical service, services provided in the residence, it is a therapeutic self-healing community sure. and these people heal each other. Mm -hmm. And I think we also should uh, talk for a moment about what the term high functioning means because um, maybe somewhat understandably there are people in the community who misunderstand the term uh, and high functioning I think in your in the context we're talking about here um, is, is somebody who can be at work could be maybe a fairly ex a successful uh, business person or, or mm -hmm. whatever they do and still have an addiction and so when somebody as somebody did uh, make a statement and, and I know the person very well and he's you know he's a really good person and he's very successful but again there's this misunderstanding uh, so the question in that case as you well know was how can a high functioning person have to be assimilated back into society and and his take on it was that's a contradiction in terms mm -hmm. well it's not you know that somebody's high functioning and it we we know of it we hear of it all the time but they could you know ha have a problem with alcohol and the reason they don't quote have to be assimilated back because they're not confronting their problem. Sure. But but in but in fact, they really are not operating within, you know, the uh, the, the conventions of society. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, right. they maybe appear to be, but good, they're not. Good way to put it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There right. are there are people <coughs> who are doctors, who are lawyers, who right. are businessmen. Right. Who every day leave their home, and they may have started with prescription painkillers. Right. And those prescription painkillers now become a need. They're not, no longer just satisfying the pain, but they're now being used for different purpose. They're, the individual now needs them to function. There are those who, after work, decide to stop and have a couple of drinks, and a couple of drinks turn into more. They get home, they got, you know, God willing, they do get home, uh, and the next day the process starts over again. But yet, they're able to function, they're able to work productively in most instances, but frequently it all starts to come crashing down a bit. Right. Yet they had been, up until a certain point, been operating in a way that you would think the term normal would be right. ap appearing to all the neighbors and all the friends. Right. Sometimes you see slips where people do something, uh, maybe that's a little out of the ordinary, but uh, the net of it is, is that they have been able to work, you know, raise a family, but in, at the same time they're suffering. Uh, and so um, those are the individuals that we're hoping to reach out to because the truth of the matter is they're an underserved group. Right. Um, they're the ones that unfortunately have the most embarrassment in, in a community because the perception is, is that how could it happen to John or how can it happen to Sue or Mary? Uh, but unfortunately it happens to all of us potentially. No one is, uh, there's a saying uh, I guess which is an important one. And that is, unfortunately, addiction does not discriminate. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. How, many, how many would be in residence at your uh, proposed site? We, we would think an average of eight, but a maximum of up to 14 at any particular time mm -hmm. uh, would, would be accommodated. Um, there's a perception that you know, there's going to be a, an overflow of people in the home uh, when, in fact, um, it probably will be uh, somewhere between eight and maybe 10 on average. I would say eight, probably more the, the likely number. Uh, we're suggesting 14 because we're hopeful that we could reach out and help that many. Uh, but uh, because, again, this is a relatively underserved group, 
uh, they're reticent sometimes to want to come to these types of, of residences um, uh, because they think that they can get back home and start all over again and be on the road to recovery. Yeah. And, and I was going to ask, what is the process for somebody to be uh, admitted to, to uh, a sober living home? We have, a, uh, Devin mentioned two individuals who are part of our management team and, and, par and also are consulting with us, but again are part of this team. And it's a Dr. Arnold Washington. He's a clinical psychologist. Is he affiliated with a particular uh, hospital? Or uh, um, He has been in the past. He now has a private practice in New York. Uh, he also uh, has actually lived in Chappaqua uh, for a, a very long period of his life. Uh, he was affiliated with uh, the medical facility in Valhalla, right. uh, Columbia uh, Medical School as well. Um, he was on residence, uh, on staff there, uh, but uh, he currently um, has, uh, is, is advising us because he has started uh, in, in the recent past three sober living residences. Uh, he's written seven books on addiction. Hmm. Um, he is considered uh, one of the top addiction specialists in America today. Uh, additionally, he has a partner whose name is Dr. Glenn Brot uh, Brotman. He is a, a psychiatrist, uh, again, specializing in the treatment of addiction. Uh, with their help and support and knowledge uh, and, and our capabilities as, as good management people, because our background is in management and, and financial services, you know, we believe we make a great team uh, trying to, to bring all of our different uh, expertise and resources together. So you screen, do you screen every individual? Yes, who? yes they, will, they will be screening uh, each individual um, before acceptance. Uh, we are not going to take anyone uh, who has exhibited any forms of violent crime um, or violent behavior. Uh, these will be individuals uh, that effectively... So you do background checks? Well, y the background check is done uh, through the file that uh, doc the doctors would be reviewing. Uh, those files, and plus they would be interviewed by both, both right. either one or the other or both prior to acceptance. Um, we are not going to do police background checks, um, but we will indeed uh, ask the individuals and also look at their, uh, their medical history as to you know, their background as it relates to any, any behaviors that would seemingly be suspect. But these are not criminals that we're going to accept into the residence. Uh, but I think it is fair to ask, uh, uh, um, Tom, if you're saying you're not going to do background checks on a police record, how can you be sure of that, that they're not criminals? Well, there's no certainty that 100 percent in, in correctness. Right. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, nor is there certainty that your neighbor moving in next door right. um, hasn't done something in their past. No, and I think, I mean, and again, that, that question do, does need to be asked on behalf of people who sure. have questions or concerns. Yeah. But uh, the point that you just made, I think, is extremely pertinent and valid. Uh, so when, you know, it, it's a vocal minority, let's make that clear. And the and town hall in Yorktown has said that the uh, reaction that they've gotten from people who've contacted town hall is much, much more in favor of this. Sure. Um, but if somebody says, um, I don't want a sober living home to be my neighbor, you, you know, you can plausibly respond, you already have neighbors like this, you just may not know it. That's correct. Here, you know exactly what's going on, sure. you know, and, um, and, and I think people have to think this through a little bit more perhaps than, mm -hmm. than has been the case where there's this very precipitous emotional reaction where they hear recovering addict and they don't hear recovering, they just hear addict. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah, okay. we, um, we're going to know more about the people residing in the home than any neighbor knows typically about their, their neighbor next door. Mm. Uh, we're going to have a, we'll know the background, we'll know their history, we'll know more about their family members. Um, and, and so we believe that we, we have a more secure knowledge of who we have in the home. Mm. Um, you know, it, additionally, we have the right to say, unfortunately, it doesn't seem as if you really are going to fit into what we're trying to achieve here. Right. Um, whereas neighbors down the street, when a home goes for sale, right. there is no discretion. Um, you know, if someone wants to pay the price, they're able to move in. Right. Uh, so, uh, again, we're, we're hoping that we're able to complement the residents with individuals who are seeking to get well. Right. Uh, why come there? Why would they want to come there if they're not really trying to improve themselves and recover? And, and I think that's the other point, is that we're talking about people who, by trying to make themselves better are, by extension, trying to make the world better. 
Yeah. Right. So how, how would anybody want to oppose that? Or why would anybody right. want to oppose that? Sure. Let's, on a technical note, let's talk about the fact that uh, you are seeking uh, a special permit right, from the town of Yorktown. Sure. And, and if you could just uh, sure. summarize what that's about. The, uh, the town code provides for, under a nursing home provision, which is the heading, a subheading called convalescent home or residence. And we're applying for a special use permit uh, for a convalescent home or residence, which basically defines itself as people who have been suffering from an illness needing a time to heal. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. The individuals who have been suffering with addiction are suffering from a disease. And no different than other people suffering from other diseases, there's a period of time that they need to heal. And so we're hoping that we can provide that, that environment, a loving, nurturing environment, one that treats them with respect, trying to rebuild their self-esteem, these are, these are people who have been beaten down personally and, and, and through, uh, through shame. And we're trying to help lift them back up again. Right. Uh, so uh, the, the special use permit uh, provides that uh, we can, every three years, reapply for the permit so long as we've met conditions uh, that might be set by the town board and agreed by us. And we've mentioned uh, in a couple of occasions to both the town board uh, through our attorney, Al Capolini, as well as uh, to the public, that we're willing to try to be very fair in terms of the conditions that might be set. And we're willing to indicate, for example, that we won't take individuals in who have exhibited any degree of, of violence. We won't take people in with a criminal background other than a DWI. Uh, we've indicated that uh, we are even willing to have a sit-down one-year review with the town to ensure that we're doing everything we say we're going to do. We've just recently provided, which will be given to the town at the board meeting on Tuesday, a list of house rules that people will need to uh, abide by. And right. the rules are probably uh, rules that are even more uh, substantial than most families would ever abide by. And again, the, the reality here is, and we, you mentioned it earlier, is that who wouldn't want to live next to a home that's not going to have wild parties? Right, exactly. That's not right. going to have people yep. drugging and drinking and not going to have a lot of traffic because they're not going to have re uh, vehicles on the residence property. Uh, and and there, there are, I mean, perhaps as with any community, there are um, incidents, unfortunately, in Yorktown, the, the Yorktown Police Department could, uh, could talk about uh, underage drinking parties. Every so often there may be a case where the parents are even home. I would, I would ask the people who maybe, you know, have been voicing some opposition to this, maybe to turn your focus on things like that that really do need to be uh, controlled. Uh, and just an ending, because we only have a couple of minutes. I, without getting into detail, um, I know you were talking, Tom, before we uh, went on with the show about, uh, the best way I think to put it uh, is that the, the house has a certain karma about it. And let's just say that there's something about the history of the house that traces itself back to the founder, right, of, um, of Alcohol Alcoholics Alcohol. Anonymous. Yeah. So there seems to be some karma going on here that that's what that house is destined to be a sober living home. Sure. <laughs> uh, just uh, this past week, the sellers of the home, who are our friends and, and wonderful people, um, and are very supportive of our, our hope to use this for a sober living residence, uh, Julie Testaweed uh, just found out that her uncle was actually one of the spiritual mentors to Bill Wilson, uh, one of the writers of the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous book. Yeah. Um, and, and it's just an amazing... Uh, I guess, series of, of, of not just coincidences, but perhaps a higher power right. bringing this together. No, um, I think that, and that's sort of a, a grace note to end this on, invoking the name of the town supervisor. So any, <laughs> we, want, we want to thank uh, Tom McCrossin and Mark McGoldrick and Deborah McCrossin of Compass Westchester for being with us. You know, all uh, good fortune in, in moving forward with, you know, what is a really necessary uh, endeavor, you know, not just in Yorktown, but everywhere. And thank you for watching Frank Talks with Bruce the Blog. And remember, when Bruce the Blog listens, people talk. Thank you. Well, hopefully we'll have the opportunity to uh, have you back to talk about uh, how to talk. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. That would be nice, yeah. Well, I mean, I would think one way or another.